So, um, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Odit uh, Gala, uh, we are very happy uh, to have this event today. Um, we would like to speak uh, about uh, the new book of Odit, uh, and uh, this book is coming out uh, actually tomorrow um, in the United States, later on in other parts of the world, going into 30 language around, languages around the globe. And it's about the journey of humanity, the origins of wealth and uh, inequality. Now, um, let me, uh, however, before we um, start with the uh, real, the real event, um, uh, begin with a different issue uh, as a signal of uh, stark solidarity with the Ukraine. I would uh, invite you uh, to be all quiet with us or with me and uh, uh, for a moment to um, uh, think about uh, the situation and hope for the best. So thank you, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, now, uh, let me start with uh, some official uh, remarks uh, on the event. Um, uh, uh, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is an event, amazing uh, afternoon with a large size of uh, interested people around the close, uh, globe. We have about 200 uh, people who have registered. now. Uh, Odet Gala will speak about his new book, The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. Now, Odet is the Herbert Goldberger Professor of Economics at Brown University and one of the uh, profoundest uh, economic thinkers uh, of, of the world. He has published his research in the best academic outlets of the profession. His contributions uh, focus uh, for long around the fundamental causes of development, prosperity, and inequality over the entire span of uh, human history. As a driving force behind uh, what he calls unified growth theory and the role of genetic diversity for development, he seeks uh, to uncover the fundamental causes of uh, the path uh, of human well-being across a time uh, and space. Audit Gala was awarded doctorates honoris causa from UC Louvain and from Poznan University of Economics and Business. He is an elected foreign member of Academia Europea and an elected fellow of the Economic Society. He is affiliated with many distinguished academic networks like NBR, CPR, GLO, ICA, among others. Furthermore, he is the editor in chief of the Journal of Economic Growth editor of the Journal of Population Economics and co-editor of Macroeconomic Dynamics. He has served the profession in many unique ways. Now, his new book, The Journey of Humanity's Origins of Wealth and Inequality, comes at a, at a time of a dramatic setback in economic history, as for a few weeks now, the aggressive war against the Ukraine reveals. Europe experiences some of the darkest days uh, on the continent uh, since World War II with unpredictable ending. The book could not foresee this development, but it nevertheless feeds the hope for a long-term rise in humanity of increased wealth, understanding, and collaboration. As Odet Gala writes at the beginning of his global review of history in this book, the out, he says, uh, I cite, the outlook derived from this exploration uh, can be described as fundamentally hopeful in terms of the overarching trajectory of societies across the globe. Education, tolerance, and greater gender equality hold the keys to our species flourishing in the decades and centuries uh, to come. And after discussing uh, major global catastrophes over the last century, he writes towards the end of the book, 
I am citing again, but history shows that scattering and dreadful, uh, and dreadful as they are, these events have had limited long-term impact on the grand arc of human development. The rentless march of humanity has so far been unstoppable. Well, the book helps, uh, as in my view, after I had the pleasure to read it, helps us to see the mechanisms and common institutions we need to invest and struggle for to foster human development and to overpower disaster. Well, now, Odette, uh, welcome again. And now, please uh, go on uh, delivering uh, your, your speech. And I will move you away now into the speaking uh, situation. OK, now, Odette, you are the speaker. You want to share the screen, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Klaus, for a wonderful introduction. I'm delighted uh, to be here and to introduce you to my uh, forthcoming book. As Klaus suggested, the book will appear tomorrow in the United States, uh, the day after tomorrow in Spain, and in the subsequent uh, two or three weeks in 30 different languages across the globe. So the journey of humanity is an attempt to explore the evolution of human societies since the emergence of an atomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it surrounds two of the most fundamental mysteries that govern this journey. The mystery of growth, namely what are the roots of the dramatic transformation in living standards in the past two centuries after hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation, and the mystery of inequality, namely, what is the origin of this vast inequality in the wealth of nations? Now, over most of human existence, human life was nasty, brutish, and short. In fact, it was remarkably similar to that of other species across the globe. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level. And there were minor differences in living conditions across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, one fourth of newborn died before reaching their first birthday, and one half of them did not reach the reproductive age. Numerous women perished during childbirth. Life expectancy fluctuated in a narrow range of 25 to 40 and rarely exceeded 40. Most humans during this time period hardly departed from the remote birthplace. They live in the darkness after the disappearance of the sun over the horizon, and they were largely illiterate. And perhaps most strikingly, this was a time period in which an economic crisis did not lead into bell tightening, but in fact, led into mass starvation and extinction. But if you think about life not so long ago and the quality of life not so long ago, the quality of life of an English farmer in the 16th century was very similar to the quality of life of a Chinese serf in the 14th century, a Mayan peasant in the 5th century, a Greek herder in the 4th century BC, an Egyptian farmer 5,000 years ago, and even a shepherd in Jericho 11,000 years ago. And then in the past two centuries, we see this incredible metamorphosis dramatic transformation in living standards within and across societies. Income per capita in the world as a whole in the past two centuries increasing 14-fold after a long period of stagnation that lasted 
300,000 year period, life expectancy has more than doubled, and a great divergence took place in income per capita across countries and regions of the world. In order to illustrate this dramatic metamorphosis, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem in the Roman period. And suppose that I whisk these individuals in a time machine from Roman Jerusalem in the first century to Ottoman Jerusalem in the 19th century. Despite this 2000 year jump, these individuals would be able to instantaneously adjust to the new environment. Past knowledge would, lead, would be largely applicable. <clears throat> Technological improvement over this time period would be merely incremental. And as a result of it will allow individuals to adapt quite rapidly to the new technological environment. Occupations would require very similar skills and life expectancy would remain largely unchanged. And as a result of it would not require a change in a future oriented mindset. But take these individuals, take these residents of Jerusalem and whisk them 200 years further in time from Jerusalem of the 19th century to Jerusalem of today. Despite this shorter time horizon in which they whisk away in time, this would be a shocking experience, a devastating experience. Past knowledge would be largely obsolete. Modern technologies would appear to them as a witchcraft. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills and life expectancy would instantaneously double and would require future-oriented mindset, education decisions, saving decisions, and life cycle decisions. So as I said, in contrast to the conventional wisdom, living standards has not increased gradually in the course of human history. Technology, evolved gradually in the course of human history, but it had negligible impact on living standard over most of human history. In fact, the dramatic increase in living standards in the past two centuries reflect what I would define as a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation in living standards once a tipping point has been reached. Now, one manifestation of this metamorphosis in the past two centuries is the evolution of income per capita in the past 2,000 years. And as you can see in the graph, if you look at different regions of the world in the past two centuries, it appears that living standards had not evolved over this, this, this time period in any significant fashion. Living standard fluctuated around a subsistence level of consumption over a prolonged period of time. And then in the course of industrialization, we see this dramatic metamorphosis, a dramatic increase in income per capita across the globe. On average, income per capita increases 14 fold, but in the context of some societies, this increase is perhaps 15 fold and 100 fold. Now, if you look at this output for a moment, and in fact, if I would delete the access from this figure, this would appear as an output of a seismograph that is detecting tectonic activities across the globe. It would appear as an outcome of a rapid eruption that occurs somewhere across the globe. But as I said, this is in fact the way that income per capita evolve in the course of human history. Stagnation of a 300,000 year period, and then a rapid eruption in the context of the past few centuries. But at the same time, this eruption is not occurring at the same time period across the globe. Some societies are experiencing this transition at the beginning of the 19th century, and perhaps even earlier, and other societies only very recently. And since this transition is associated with a 14-fold increase in income per capita on average 
we see this dramatic increase in inequality across nations and across regions of the world. And consequently, we would like to have a better understanding of the roots of inequality across the globe. We would like to have a better understanding of the dramatic increase in living standard across the globe. We will have to have a better understanding of the forces that permitted the transition from stagnation to growth. The forces that led into the differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth across the globe and the forces that ultimately led into the barriers for this takeoff from stagnation to growth in some societies and an earlier transition in other societies. And naturally, the resolution of these two fundamental mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, will provide us and policymakers with important insights about the design of strategies to mitigate inequality across the globe as a whole. Now, naturally, based on the depiction of this evidence, it is quite apparent that in order to resolve inequality across the globe, in order to have a better understanding of the roots of this inequality, we have to understand the conditions that prevailed in the world across human history. Namely, we have to have a better understanding of the phases of economic development and the forces that operated in the distant past and how ultimately they led into this differential timing of a transition across the globe and to the inequality as we see it across the globe. Now, when we think about phases of economic development, one can roughly divide the process of development into three fundamental phases, the Malthusian epoch, the post-Malthusian regime and the modern growth regime. The Malthusian epoch emerges at the time in which humans are emerging in Africa 300,000 years ago, and it lasts over 99.9% .9 of human existence till the eve of industrialization in the context of the most developed societies in the world. During this time period, economies are experiencing interesting dualism, stagnation in income per capita, stagnation in, in life expectancy, along with great dynamism in technology, population, and human adaptation. <clears throat> and it is this dynamism that ultimately allows humanity to escape from the arms of the Malthusian activists. And around the end of the 18th century, in the context of the most advanced societies, we see the takeoff into what I will define as the post-Malthusian regime. Income per capita is spiking along with population. But ultimately it is the demographic transition towards the end of the 19th century that frees the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and permit the world to sail into the modern growth regime. So as I said, in order to understand this transition and in order to understand much of the inequality as we see across the globe, we will have to have a better understanding of the forces that operated in the distant past. And the starting point will be the forces that operated during the Malthusian epoch. And unlike conventional wisdom, the Malthusian epoch is characterized by interesting dualism, stagnation, along with dynamism. There is great stagnation in living standards. Income per capita fluctuates with very little trend over a prolonged period of time around the subsistence level and, income and life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 20 to five to 40 over a prolonged period of time. But at the same time, there is great dynamism that occurs over the Malthusian epoch. At any point in time, we see slow technological progress, slow population growth, and slow adaptation. But over this 300,000 year period, this slow process amounts to technological progress that bring us from Stone Age technology to steam engine technology, 
is bringing us from population of about two and a half million people in the eve of the agricultural revolution to about one billion people in the process of industrialization, a 400 fold increase in the size of the human population over a 12,000 year period. And at the same time, is making the population more adaptable to the technological environment and to the geographical environment. And it is this Malthusian dynamism and this holy triangle, technological progress, population growth and adaptation that is ultimately triggering the transition from stagnation to growth. So when we think about the Malthusian epoch, there's three critical elements to consider. First, the impact of technology on prosperity and population growth. So during this time period, technological progress increased income per capita only in the short run. Population grew as a result of it due to mortality decline, fertility increase, and consequently income per capita inevitably reverted back to its long run position. And consequently, during the Malthusian epoch, technologically advanced societies and land-rich economies had higher population densities at very similar levels of income per capita. And this is quite apparent in the data. If you look at the relationship between land productivity and population density, say in the year 1500, there is a pronounced positive association between the two. But if you look at the relationship between land productivity and income per capita in the same time period, the year 1500, there is no association between the two. Similarly, if you look at the relationship between technological advancement and population density in the year 1500, a positive association. But if you look at the impact of technology on income per capita in the year 1500, again, no impact. So this is an important building block. Technology, technological advancement over this time period is resulting in more people, but not richer people. The second important building block is human adaptation. The Malthusian pressure, as I just suggested, affected the size of the population, but at the same time, it affected the composition of the population. Naturally, traits that were complementary to the growth process generated tautologically higher income, and as a result of it, higher reproductive success. Namely, these traits were transmitted intergenerationally from parent to child. But at the same time, they were imitated and led into horizontal transmission in society. And consequently, they became more and more prevalent in society. And consequently, adaptation, led into the raise of the prevalence of complementary traits to the growth process and reinforced the growth process and ultimately the takeoff from stagnation to growth. And the third critical element is in fact the impact of this change in the size of the population and the composition of the population on technological progress. And during this time period, we see that the size of the population affects naturally the supply of innovators, the supply of innovations, and the demand for innovations, and the diffusion of knowledge, and the division of labor, and the extent of trade, and via reverse engineering technological progress. So again, during this period, we see this reinforcing interaction between the size of the population, composition of the population and technological progress. So during the Malthusian epoch, the size of population and the composition of the population affected technological progress. And at the same time, technological progress affected the size and the composition of the population. And this reinforcing interaction accelerated the pace of technological progress over time until technological progress started to outpace the ability of individuals to be engaged in reproduction. We start to see the growth in income per capita, okay, and a dramatic increase in population growth as well. But the rotation of this wheel of change is intensifying over this time period. Technological progress is accelerating further 
and ultimately it reaches a critical threshold. Beyond this threshold, human capital suddenly start to be essential in order to allow individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. Consequently, we see the formation of human capital and this formation of human capital, given limited budget constraint, is triggering a reduction in fertility. The Malthusian equilibrium simply vanishes, and consequently, the growth process is freed from the counterbalancing effect of population. And consequently, technological progress, human capital formation, and the decline in population growth are contributing to the transition to the modern era of sustained economic growth. So as I said, if you look at the wheels of change in the course of human history, the composition of the human population, the size of the human population and technological progress, the operator, operating relentlessly in the course of human history, the size of the population increases, Human are adapting to the technological environment and technology is gaining pace. And ultimately technological progress is moving so rapidly that in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment, individuals must invest in the education of their children. As they invest in the education of their children, they must economize on the size of their, of their families we see the fertility transition, and then we see a phase transition from the Malthusian epoch into the modern growth regime. Now, it is important to understand that this phase transition is very similar to the one that exists in nature when we think about the transition from liquid to gas. But as we know, as we warm temperature gradually at a certain point, once the critical threshold is being rich, water are converted into gas. Very similarly, in the course of human history, technology is gaining pace, but over most of human history, we are replacing one stone tool by another stone tool, by an iron tool. Progress is very, very slow. And as a result of it, human capital, investment in education is not needed in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. But then, ultimately, the pace of technological progress inevitably gain a pace such that the technological environment is changing very rapidly. There is a phase transition, similar to water that are reaching the temperature of 100 degrees and are moving from liquid to gas. In the context of human history, we see this critical pace of technological progress beyond which we see the transition from the agrarian stage of development, the agricultural stage of development into the modern growth regime. But importantly, as we see in the context of the transition from water to gas, not all water molecules are converted from water to gas at the same pace. Some are converting earlier than others. And the same occurred in the context of human history. Some societies moved from the epoch of stagnation to an era of sustained economic growth earlier than others. And as a result of it, a huge divergence occurred in the world economy during this transition. So as economies are sailing into the modern growth regime, the most advanced societies in the world, Western Europe and Western Africans, are experiencing a growth rate of about 2% per year over the past 150 years. But naturally, if we think about the march of humanity, the question that emerges is whether this march is in fact unstoppable. Thus far, it appears that this march is unstoppable. If you think about shattering and dreadful events, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Spanish flu, and most recently COVID-19. These were devastating events in the course of human history, and they really shattered the individuals that lived through them. But nevertheless, they had a limited impact on the grand arc of human development. Living standards 
in all these occasions, swiftly recovered from all these catastrophes. Now at the moment, we are facing the atrocities that are associated with the Russian aggression and the devastation of this particular war appears beyond comprehension. But nevertheless, history suggests yet again that it is very unlikely to derail humanity from its relentless march forward. Again, human history is providing us with a perspective that is rather important in this dreadful time to realize that these events, as I said, devastating and horrific as they are, are not long lasting and humanity will recover from these events uh, as it did in the past. But nevertheless, the question is whether in fact climate change will be the most devastating event of all and whether in fact this will be the event that will ultimately derail humanity from its long run course. And here again, the journey of humanity as a book and the journey of humanity as a metaphor provides a very hopeful outlook. It suggests to us that it is technological acceleration in the course of human history and its impact on industrialization that brought about the current trend of climate change. But at the same time, it is this technological acceleration that also brought about human capital formation and the power of innovations. And at the same time, it brought about this persistent decline in fertility rate that is sweeping the world as a whole. And consequently, these elements that are byproduct of this technological acceleration could mitigate the pace of climate change and provide us the time for the advancement of revolutionary technologies that will be needed to mitigate this uh, adverse effect of climate change. And as we see in the context of the recent uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the power of innovation reach a critical point in which in fact humanity can overcome potentially devastating events that could have lasted significantly longer due to these revolutionary technologies. And in the context of climate change, the fact that fertility is declining across the globe, and India has just recently reached fertility rate at replacement level, suggests that these events and these patterns will buy scientists the necessary time few more decades to develop this revolutionary technology that at the moment we cannot envision fully that ultimately may turn this climate crisis into a fading memory. So in the context of the first part of the book, I'm marching forward in time since the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa 300,000 years ago to the present. And then in the second part of the book, I'm trying to understand the roots of inequality across the globe. And as I suggest, if we think about the roots of global inequality as we see them today, it appears that much of the inequality in the world in the present time originated in the differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth in the past 200 years and the barriers that some societies face in the process of accumulation and in the process of technological adoption. And consequently, it appears that events that occurred in the distant past may be critical for the understanding of the roots of inequality as we see it at the present. So it is tempting to look at the, what I would define as the proximate causes of development namely to attribute cross-country cross differences in income per capita, to differences in education, differences in physical capital formation, and the differences in technology. Yes, that's completely right, but it doesn't resolve the problem. The question would be then why some societies fail to efficiently invest in physical and human capital? Why some societies fail 
to adopt advanced technologies. And these leaders think about the barriers in the process of accumulation, the barriers in the process of technological advancement, namely to consider historical and prehistorical roots of comparative development. And if we think about these deeper roots, the first roots that comes to mind are institutional and cultural characteristics. And ultimately, as we will move further and we will try to peel the layer of influence on, uh, on the uh, contemporary level of inequality, this will take us into the ultimate roots, namely geographical characteristics and societal characteristics. What I will do at the moment, I will basically consider various layers of influence in the context of comparative development. And I will peel them gradually, one layer at a time. And the first layer of influence will be what I will define as the fingerprints of institutions. So naturally, look at the globe as a whole. We see that some societies are benefiting from, uh, from what I will define as growth enhancing inclusive institutions. And other societies are experiencing the presence of growth retarding extractive institutions. And the question is what led to the emergence of these differential institutions across the globe? Now, one can appeal to critical junctures in the course of human history. But again, institutions to a large extent are rarely manna from heaven, are rarely triggered by these critical junctures. But let's consider for a moment these random critical junctures in the course of human history. So naturally, if we think about the Korea Peninsula and the division of the Korean Peninsula along the 38th parallel, Naturally, this division led into a northern part that is uh, under the influence of the communist doctrine and a southern one that is under the influence of the Western doctrine, the capitalist doctrine. And this division ultimately over time led to a huge divergence between the North and the South, where the South enjoys an income per capita that is 24 fold larger than the one in the South, and life expectancy that is 11 years longer than the one in the North. So naturally, this critical juncture, this random event led into a, a huge divergence in income per capita. And we can think about a counterfactual history in which the division would have occurred along a different, uh, a, a different uh, latitude, or the division would have occurred in such a way that in fact the North would have been a sphere of influence of capitalism and the South, a sphere of influence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, communism. We can think about other events. Historians are referring to the impact of the Black Death on the decline of feudalism. Naturally, the Black Death led to scarcity of labor and the decline of feudalism in, uh, in England. And this decline in feudalism is sometimes associated in, uh, in, uh, in, with uh, the emergence of property rights and ultimately perhaps the emergence of industrialization in England rather than in other societies uh, in Western Europe. We can consider the impact of the glorious revolution on the emergence of constitutional monarchy in England, and again, ultimately on industrialization. So as I said, one can consider counterfactual history in which the glorious revolution would not have occurred. And in fact, James II would have defeated Williams of Orange and consequently, England would revert into Catholicism and in fact will, will maintain absolute monarchy rather than a constitutional monarchy. In which case it is quite likely that in fact industrialization would have occurred earlier. But as I said, largely speaking, institutions are not manifold. They're not based on random critical junctures. 
institutions mostly evolved gradually in the course of human history. The Neolithic Revolution, for instance, generated an increasing population density and consequently generated a demand for institutions, for a code of conduct can, that can foster cooperation, that can foster the construction of, uh, of public goods. Fertile land more generally, yet again, increased population density and increase the demand for rule of law. Suitability of land for large plantation led to massive land concentration and ultimately into the adoption of extractive institutions and slavery. And the disease environment led to underdevelopment and delay adoption of centralized institutions. So largely speaking, institutions appears to be important for the understanding of economic development. And from time to time, these institutions emerge due to random critical junctures. But largely speaking, in fact, institutions are byproduct of deeper factors, geographical factors and human factors, as we will discuss momentarily. So the next layer of influence that I would like to uh, to uh, consider after peeling the layer of influence of institution is the cultural factor. And here again, we see the emergence of differential cultural traits <clears throat> across countries and regions. And in particular, in the context of the Italian divide and the large gap between the northern uh, part and the southern part in the context of income per capita, where income per capita in the south is about two thirds of the one in the north. Different scholars suggested that growth enhancing, enhancing cultural traits, such as social capital that were adopted in the north and growth retarding cultural traits, such as family ties that were adopted in the south are behind the uh, divide between the north and the south in Italy. But again, cultural traits are rarely manna for men. Yes, there are some instances in human history in which random growth enhancing cultural traits were adopted. This was the case in the context of Judaism where mandatory literacy was imposed in the first century. And at a time in which in fact, literacy was not uh, useful in the context of uh, of occupations and, uh, and prosperity. But ultimately, these cultural traits persisted and became very, uh, very important due to the increase in the reward to human capital in urban occupations. Or we can think about the Protestant Reformation and the emphasis on thrift and entrepreneurship as another sort of cultural mutation that ultimately persisted over time and led into economic prosperity. Although the Protestant Reformation is naturally is not truly a mutation, it occurs in the context of religious competition and an attempt by uh, individuals to differentiate their product from others. But as I said, culture is rarely man for man. Culture mostly evolved and adapted to the geographical environment, to the institutional environment, to the economic environment. So for instance, the rise in the return to human capital increased gradually the predisposition toward child quality. The degree of return or natural return to uh, agricultural investment affected the ability of individuals to delay gratification and consequently the emergence of future-oriented mindset. Climatic volatility affected loss aversion and consequently entrepreneurial spirit and plow suitability affected the adoption of the plow and ultimately gender biases in society. So again, it appears that largely speaking, culture is in fact a byproduct of geographical elements, a byproduct of deeper elements than, um, than we explored so far. So this will lead, lead us to the removal of the cultural layer 
and the consideration of the shadow of geography. So when you think about geographical characteristics, soil quality, the disease environment, geographical isolation, they have naturally a direct impact on labor productivity and human capital formation. And at the same time, they have an indirect impact, as I just suggested, on the evolution of cultural and institutional characteristics. So geography is naturally an ultimate force that is very important for the understanding of comparative development directly and indirectly via the emergence of cultural and institutional characteristics. But as we continue to peel the layers of interest, History will take us 12,000 years back to the legacy of the agricultural revolution, the first monumental revolution in the course of human history. And as we know, the transition from hunter-gatherer tribes to agricultural communities in the course of the agricultural revolution led into the emergence of a non-food producing class that was associated with knowledge creation in the form of science, in the form of technology, and in the form of written languages. And this ultimately led into a technological head start that persisted over time. And consequently, as argued by Diamond in his monumental book, variations in the timing of the Neolithic revolution across the globe could be associated with variation in economic prosperity across the globe. Let's be a little more precise. So according to the diamond hypothesis, the prosperity of Euro-Asia reflects geographical factors that were conducive for biodiversity, namely large number of domesticable species of plants and animals. And at the same time, Euro-Asia was associated with an east-west orientation of this body mass. And consequently, it led into the diffusion of agricultural practices along similar latitudes. And these forces led into an earlier transition into agriculture. It led into <clears throat> earlier onstart of this technological head start, and ultimately to the domination of Eurasia in 1491. Diamond, unfortunately, suggests that in fact it led into the domination in the contemporary era as well, but this is false, as I explained uh, lengthily in, in the book. And the reason is very simple. The Neolithic Revolution had a dual effect on economic prosperity. Precisely as Diamond argued, it led into a technological head start, but at the same time, it led into comparative advantage in agriculture. And as the world moved into an urban environment, and most of the technological spillover occurred in the urban environment, this comparative advantage in agriculture became a liability. And consequently, the Neolithic Revolution is no longer affecting comparative development across the globe. So if we want to understand inequality across the globe today, we will not be able to rely on uh, on the Neolithic Revolution. If you want to understand comparative development on 1491, the Neolithic Revolution will be one of the important components then. So as I said, as we peel various layers of influence, we are drawn back to the year 12,000 BC, uh, 10,000 BC, namely to the onset of, uh, of the Neolithic Revolution. But naturally, Humanity originated earlier, and Homo sapiens originated earlier. Homo sapiens started to populate the world in the course of the, the exodus from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago. And the question is, if we move even further, does it really allow us to have a better understanding of comparative development? So this leads us into what I will define as the out of Africa hypothesis of comparative development. Namely that the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago affected the distribution of population diversity across regions of the globe and consequently comparative economic development. 
And the argument is simple. During the exodus of modern humans from Africa, departing populations carried with them only a subset of the cultural, phenotypic, behavioral, linguistic, etc., diversity that existed in their parental colonies. And since migration was sequential, the further societies moved out of Africa, the lower was the degree of the div their diversity. And we can see it quite clearly in this illustration. Humanity emerges somewhere in Africa, most likely in East Africa, nearly 300,000 years ago. And at a certain point, as I said, 60 to 90,000 years ago, we see the departure of humans from Africa into other regions of the world. Now, the departing population is relatively small, and the original population is relatively small. And as a result of it, since we have a limited sample from, from a limited population, the population that departs and say settle the Fertile Crescent is not carrying the entire diversity that existed in the initial population. This population is settling here, is less diverse. It grows over time. And ultimately, the land cannot support this population. And populations start to, diver to, um, to migrate further. Some to Europe 45,000 years ago, others into uh, Asia and into the Americas, crossing the Bering Strait about 25,000 years ago and moving into South America around 14,000 years ago. But in this process, importantly, as you can see, the degree of diversity is declining further and further and further. So in fact, if you compute migratory distance from Africa, you look at different measures of diversity, it is striking to see how tight is the relationship between migratory distance from Africa and population diversity measured in different forms. Now, when you think about population diversity, naturally it has conflicting effects on economic development. On the one hand, there are beneficial effects on creativity and innovations. Naturally, cross-fertilization of ideas and complementarity in the production process is leading into higher productivity. But at the same time, diversity has an adverse effect on social cohesiveness. It generates mistrust, it generates disagreement about the desirable public goods, and it generates greater degree of ethnic fractionalization. And all these forces are operating towards interpersonal and ethnic conflicts. So we see these two conflicting effects, and we see them very clearly in the data, both in the context of the prevalence of civil conflicts, more diverse societies, more civil conflicts, both within ethnic groups and within, within uh, nations. We can see it in the context of the impact of diversity on fractionalization. We see it in the context of the impact of diversity on trust. But at the same time, we see the positive impact of diversity on, uh, on innovations as measured by scientific articles uh, relative to GDP. And consequently, if we have positive and diminishing effects of diversity on innovations and positive and diminishing effects of homogeneity on social cohesiveness, this implies a hump-shaped relationship between diversity and development. Namely, there will be a level of diversity that is conducive for productivity, an intermediate one, and this level of diversity would be expected to shift rightward as we move into a more demanding technological environment in recent periods. And this is precisely what we see in the data. We look at the relationship between diversity and productivity. You can see it in the context of urbanization rate in, in the year 1500, the hump-shaped relationship. You can see it in the context of population density in the year 1500. You can see it in the context of income per capita in a contemporary period or you can see it in the context of luminosity per capita in the context of the contemporary period. And in fact, the magnitude is enormous. If you take a society like Bolivia, that is the most homogeneous country in our sample, and 
you consider Bolivia having the level of diversity that is maximizing productivity, income per capita in Bolivia, simply by discount, will increase by a factor of five. This is accounting for education, institution, culture, geography, etc. And the same is true for Ethiopia. You take Ethiopia, the most diverse country in our sample, then again, if you move Ethiopia closer to the, uh, uh, to the peak, then income per capita in Ethiopia will increase by a factor of about two. Sizable amount. And this will be true regardless of whether you consider countries or ethnic groups. If you consider all the ethnic groups in the ethnographic atlas, 1,265 ethnic groups, and you consider the evolution of productivity as measured by population density, 10,000 BC, 5,000 BC, 1,000 BC, 1,500 BC, this pronounced ham shaped relationship is there in every uh, millennia that you wish to focus on. So what we can see here is that in the course of human history, as I said earlier, the wheels of change are rotating, population size increases, humans are adapting, and technological progress is becoming faster and faster. But they are not operating in, in a vacuum. Naturally, institutional and cultural factors affect the size of the population and the composition of the population indirectly due to protection of property rights, technological progress. But at the same time, we see these initial conditions, geography that is affecting uh, the wheels of change and human diversity that is affecting the wheels of change. And consequently, in the course of human history, we see the rotation of these wheels of change, but not in the same pace across the globe. And once this rotation reaches this critical point, we see this phase transition, an increase in investment in human capital, a demographic transition, and a transition to the modern world's regime. But as I said, this occurs in different time periods across the globe. But when you think about deep-rooted factors as opposed to contemporary factors, and you ask yourself, how much of, of the variations in income per capita across the globe can be accounted by deep-rooted factors? It is nearly 90% of the variations. So the dispersal of anatomically modern human from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago explains nearly 17 to 26% of these variations, of the unexplained variations. Time since human settlement and the Neolithic revolution, a relatively small fraction. And it is mostly time since human settlement, 3%. Geographic and climatic factors, a huge fraction, 27 to 38%. The disease ecology, 9 to 14%. Cultural factors, 20 to 22%. And institutional factors, around 3 to 9%. So all factors are important. Okay, and naturally, that's what we would expect. We're scientists and uh, we don't think that there is a single cause for, uh, for virtually anything that is operating on planet Earth. And you can see that, in fact, the various forces contributed greatly to comparative development. Now, does it imply that we have historical determinism? Not at all. On the contrary, the insights from the journey of humanity permits us, in fact, to design growth enhancing policies that are critical for the ability of humanity to flourish in the decades and the century ahead. But it is very important to understand this will be policies that are country specific, history specific. We cannot basically fit one policy to all countries at once as used to be the case in the era of the Washington Consensus. For instance, we can design education policies that are geared towards <clears throat> social cohesiveness and tolerance in diverse societies, such as Ethiopia. But at the same time, education policies that are geared towards pluralism in homogeneous ones, such as Bolivia, thinking outside of, of the box, challenging the status quo, fostering cultural exchange. So naturally, different countries can benefit from different policies. The policy, education policies in Ethiopia will be struck 
it will be strikingly different than the ones in, Ethiopia, in, in Bolivia. And similarly, we can design policies that would foster growth enhancing cultural traits. For instance, future oriented mindset that is naturally critical for education investment, for adoptions of technologies, etc. So for places in the world that climatic conditions led into lower natural return to agricultural investment, one can design policies that would foster future-oriented mindset and would mitigate the adverse conditions that were created by nature. And similarly, in places where plow suitability led into gender biases, again, one can foster education policies that will further enhance the idea that gender equality is fundamental for the development of nations. So these are the two parts of the book. First one is taking us forward in time from the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa 300,000 years ago to the present. And the second one, resolve the mystery of inequality by moving back in time from the contemporary era to the dispersal of anatomically modern human in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Odette, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, maybe you now take off the, uh, the, the slide uh, show so that we can at the same time, I will now un uh, allow everybody to unmute, but uh, we have already questions. Uh, let me, uh, so to speak, uh, start uh, with uh, the first First issue, your uh, concept, your uh, your book basically argues that there are three um, aspects which is which are driving uh, the fate of humanity, in particular the rise um, in in well-being and income, uh, but also inequality. Well, one is the geography, um, second is genes, and third is culture and institutions values. Now, uh, so far I get this, uh, the, the whole rise in well-being has to do with uh, an increasing uh, accumulation of culture, institutions, values, uh, things we are creating out of ourselves, so to speak, uh, which drives next to technology, of course, uh, the, uh, the progress. But what makes you so sure that culture and values cannot be destroyed? That's well, uh, we have seen also over the last decades a fall in the value of rationality and uh, and expert wis wisdoms and and so on. Um, uh, culture uh, can be destroyed also. I mean, empires have disappeared uh, and so on in history. Uh, uh, I understand that there will be waves, but um, a trend upwards looks like the old uh, Marxian prophecy that we all will live in communism at one day and be happy. Yes, thank you very much, Klaus. So this is, uh, yes, this is a fantastic question. Let me try to address it. But before addressing the question, uh, I would like just to make one clarification. When I refer to population diversity, I'm referring to very broad concept of population diversity. In fact, it is predominantly cultural diversity. Okay, so when I talk about deep-rooted factors and I talk about the exodus from Africa, the exodus from Africa is affecting various dimensions of diversity. We measure them today and we understand very well that it affects, as I said, uh, cultural diversity, phenomic diversity, behavioral diversity, phenotypic diversity. So I would like to keep it in, in, in mind as we think about the deep-rooted factors. So diversity, very broadly speaking, geography, and of course, culture and institutions. So again, I don't want to belittle any particular element. All elements are important. I simply want to think about them in the right sequence, namely removing different layers of influence, starting with institution, culture, geography, the Neolithic revolution, and the migration out of Africa. So now to your question about uh, uh, about the evolution of cultural traits in the course of human history, and whether in fact uh, we can see some sort of destruction of these uh, uh, cultural elements. 
So as I emphasize uh, quite strongly in, in the book, uh, and as I emphasize in the lecture, culture naturally is not manna from heaven. It's adaptable to, to the environment. And for a long period of time, we see that culture persists more than otherwise. And then at a certain point in the course of uh, the enlightenment period, in fact, we see new cultural traits that are emerging that are basically suggesting to people rather than uh, then resting on the wisdom of the ancients. Let's adopt the wisdom of the moderns. Let's believe that in fact, we can create ourselves a better world. And this is a new cultural trait that is emerging. And so, yes, so cultural traits naturally are, uh, are persisting for a long period of time, but at the same time, we see adaptability in the context of uh, of the transition from stagnation to growth in the context of the modern world. So this is something that is really important uh, uh, to realize. Now, naturally, when we think about culture, culture to a large extent is, uh, is uh, an aggregation of the collective wisdom of a particular group over the course of human history. And there was a period of time in which individuals did not have a direct knowledge about the environment in which they operated. And this co collective wisdom was instrumental to assure the survival of individuals. If say certain dietary restrictions emerge in a certain society, they, were, they emerge so as to allow individuals that do not have the knowledge about the poisonous food and otherwise, to act rationally and not basically to be, uh, to be subjected to extinction due to the lack of this knowledge. <clears throat> now we move into a different era in which we are all knowledgeable, we are all educated and we can rely on traditions, we can rely on, 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 on ancient wisdom, but at the same time, we can rely on our own uh, self. Now, naturally, part of what we develop in the course of human history is the personal affinity to freedom. And this is something that is shared by society as a whole. So yes, when we think about the current era and the devastating uh, atrocities that the Russians are committing in Ukraine, and naturally it causes us to worry about the reversion of individual freedoms. But in fact, if anything, what this current conflict suggests to us is that the, the, the spirit that the Ukraine people are, are showing in the context of the value of freedom is something that is universal across the globe. And I'm sure that uh, ultimately it will, uh, it will uh, conquer uh, Russia and China as well. But at the moment, we see this, uh, these authoritarian regimes that are basically creating uh, enormous uh, uh, damage to their citizens. But at the same time, we see the individual spirit that is prevailing despite this harsh bombardment, despite, despite this harsh treatment of, uh, of the Putin regime. And if anything, what this teaches me is that, uh, that uh, this, I, I, would, I don't know if to call it cultural trait, but perhaps freedom is partly cultural trait. This cultural trait is not going to disappear, going to be stronger and stronger over time. And as a result of it, if I would have to make projections about the course of human history, the projection would be a projection towards uh, sort of uh, more democratic regimes that are respecting the, this important value for each of us, the, the value of freedom. Um, so again, I don't, uh, I mean, while I do think about the grand arc of human history, I don't, uh, I, I, I look at history as a scientist, not as, uh, as a wishful thinker. It's not that I'm basically saying, look, I would like to see this uh, transition towards utopia and therefore this is what I would project into, into my thesis. This is not the way that I view the world. The way that I view the world is very different want to look at it scientifically. And what the science is showing me is that the march of humanity is very powerful and is driven, as I said, by these wheels of change. And it will be very difficult to derail humanity from, uh, from, uh, from this uh, uh, wonderful course, wonderful course of progress. I mean, as, as I said, there could be 
devastating events that can generate a setback for decades and perhaps even longer than that. But the resilience of humanity is based on, uh, on this fundamental elements so of the, the cherishing freedom that we see so wonderfully in the context of the, the Ukraine uh, crisis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for it so far. We have three uh, lo longish questions in the chat. You may want to look at this at the moment. In the meanwhile, I try to mobilize the audience. Uh, you have two possibilities to show uh, yourself. One, you can uh, put your video on, some of you do. Uh, uh, in particular, if you want to ask a question, um, oh, so and second, sad. if you want to ask a question, raise your hands or uh, go to the uh, reaction part uh, and 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 show your hand like I am showing here now. Yes. So um, now uh, I have seen Elsa, Elsa Fornero. You wanted to ask a question. Yes, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Well, it was a very very interesting uh, lecture or illustration of your book. And I know that you take uh, a very long perspective, as long as history is. Um, I would like to ask uh, maybe a very narrow question. And that is, what uh, is the role of uh, rights, uh, human rights uh, in your, uh, let's say, vision? Because, uh, well, as I see it, uh, uh, I see attention in the sense that uh, perhaps uh, people have always wanted rights, uh, freedom to do things, to move, to, to stay in relation one uh, another. But at the same time, they wanted, to, they wanted freedom from want, as Roosevelt said, freedom from uh, uh, having to just do things uh, to, to be alive. So in my view, in uh, recent history, at least, uh, the cement uh, between the two is represented by rights. So when you attribute rights to people, these two free, uh, aspiration to freedom move together. Uh, what do you, how, where would you put rights? Uh, into your picture? Are they institutions simply? Thank you. Thanks, Elsa. Put it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so that's a wonderful uh, question. So when I think about rights, I would probably think about rights in the context of both institutions and, uh, and culture. So as, as you said, some of this uh, uh, aspiration for rights is uh, some sort of uh, cultural phenomena. It starts perhaps with the individual, but ultimately it represents the groups as a whole. But it is mostly in the context of institutions. So naturally in the absence of rights, uh, if we, I mean, I described lengthily the barriers in the process of development, right? I mean, so as I said, when we think about the vast inequality across the globe today, much of it is originated in the context of this differential transition, and much of it is originated due to the fact that in some societies we have barriers in the process of accumulation, we have barriers in the process of education, we have barriers in the ability of individuals to adopt technologies. And much of these barriers is, is related precisely to what you have asked, in the sense that uh, uh, there are certain institutions that <laughs> societies that are basically providing individuals with property rights, with, uh, with civil liberties that allow them to think freely, to create freely, and ultimately to reap the benefits of their innovations and their creativity and their uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And in other societies, this is not, uh, not in place. And, uh, but as I said, if we think about the march of humanity in, in the course of uh, the, the, the past, uh, say, since the exodus from Africa, it does appear to be the case that there is a certain progression in which, if anything, property rights are becoming uh, 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 more respected in, in an interesting way, right? I mean, so you can think even about uh, sort of the strange, uh, 
uh, schizophrenia of the Chinese regime, in which on the one hand you have authoritarian regime, but at the same time, uh, the realization that in the absence of certain property rights, then uh, innovations will not take place and the economy cannot flourish. So some, I mean, so even in the context of authoritarian regimes, we see the gradual appreciation for the importance of property rights. Unfortunately, given the fact that we see this Mass, uh, massive inequality in some of these authoritarian regimes and the, the, the tendency to persist this inequality and uh, the status quo in terms of political inequality, it persists longer than otherwise. But again, as I said uh, earlier to Klaus, if, uh, if I would have to infer based on the progression of uh, humanity in the course of history, it appears that uh, that the progression is such that we will see more civil liberties, more, um, more of what you define as right, broadly speaking, initially in the context of property rights, but ultimately civil liberties. Uh, and these are critical for development. They're true in the context of the gender inequality, the gender gap, they're true in the context of racial gaps, and they're true in, in other contexts. I mean, and, uh, the better we realize that, in fact, this, uh, these inequalities and, uh, and uh, in different dimensions of rights, I mean, are so critical for the development process, the, the earlier we will uh, move forward in many dimensions. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, there is in the chat a question by Juan Gabriel Rodriguez. Uh, I'm not sure whether you have seen it, Odit. He argues that, uh, well, you, I know your book is full of evidence. Yes, you put, you cite lots of research, but uh, uh, Juan is uh, suggesting that some historians like Benedict Frey um, in his book, The Technology Trap, says that fertility and mort mortality in pre-industrial societies were not primarily driven by variations of wages at least not from the 16th century onward. And also in some places, uh, UK, Dutch, the Dutch Republic had already achieved sustained uh, income growth prior to the Industrial Revolution. And uh, well, now he asks, Juan asks, what do you think about this? Uh, is this just uh, an, some evidence which doesn't fit the whole story or, or out of many evidences or um, what, what else? So thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very good question. I'm happy to respond to it. So I think, I mean, that my, hopefully my presentation showed something very dramatic. And the, the dramatic element is that regardless of the, the refinements of little data about whether economy, some economies, we need to shut off the microphone of one person. Um, so please, can, yeah, uh, if you have not. Um, yeah, I can echoes. Uh, can you shut off all the rest, except for maybe yourself too, who knows? Well, I could shut off. Let me, I can shut off everybody, of course. Um, now it should be, try okay. again. Yeah, that's good. Yes, so. Uh, so think about the very basic picture that I showed, namely the evolution of either life expectancy or living standard across the globe. Life expectancy is fluctuating between five to not really disputed over most of human existence. And then we see this dramatic spike in the course of the 19th century in life expectancy. In the context of income per capita, yes, so the, the, you know, the takeoff in some societies may have occurred 100 years earlier, 100 years. This is, I mean, we have to get the big picture. The big picture is that there is a 14-fold increase in income per capita, regardless of how you look at it in the past 200 years. Maybe there was a little blip earlier. Maybe there was an increase of 10% of somewhere but not 1,400% in a 200 year period. This is what needs to be explained. And yes, there's some evidence about uh, different societies that are disputed about how wages affect fertility and not. In fact, I, my reading of the evidence is very different, but this is really missing the entire big picture. The big picture is that we see 
a movement from stagnation to growth. We see a phase transition, and that's the beauty of unified growth theory, in the sense that it's a theory that allows you to understand the phase transition, something that is very fundamental, very difficult to explain. It's not based on shock and not based on any other elements. And as I said before, in the context of the phase transition, yes, put the worm in to, for the person that asked the question, I'm sorry that I cannot see the, the name, put your cattle now on the stove and see that some of the water molecules will take will take off and become gas earlier than others. This is precisely what I do argue. Yes, yeah, so, so maybe the, some societies in Europe are taking off 100 years earlier. That's entirely consistent with the, with the broad view that I'm projecting. The important part is that we see massive stagnation and then transition. And in the context of this transition, some societies are taking off 200 years earlier, 300 years earlier, et cetera, and massive inequalities emerging across the globe. And again, given the fact that we would like to resolve inequality across the globe, the main insight here is that we need to focus on deep-rooted factors because much of this inequality, unlike the, the, the ideas promoted by, say, Solo and others about convergence, much of the inequality is occurring in the context of the past 200 years. There is some convergence in the past uh, uh, decades, but overall, we do not see major convergence. What we see is a huge divergence in the past 200 years, and this huge divergence is suggesting to us the deep-rooted factors are behind the scene. And as I said, econometric uh, analysis suggests to us that indeed, much of the inequality as we see it across the globe today has to do with uh, these two deep rooted factors. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Now um, let us un allow people to unmute. If, if there is any quick question, we have still two uh, uh, questions in the chat, but also uh, no time left in principle. So um, uh, if there's nothing quick and urgent, because we are now again at uh, five, 5.30 and uh, that's the promised end. Uh, if there is nobody asking a quick and dirty question, I, I'm, I'm afraid we should uh, stop, stop here. Uh, we all should thank uh, 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 Odette Galler for a wonderful talk uh, and a very provocative uh, outline of uh, of ideas and hopefully um, we all can believe after reading the book carefully that this is a long-term uh, development of humanity because we all like to see that coming and we like to contribute uh, to it through debate and uh, exchange. Uh, so thank you very much Odette and uh, let me stop recording here and end the meeting.